unique way that uh, counting stages, what, what, what happened in a given set, coincide with exactly sets whose best definition of first order logic is delta two. Okay, so we, we, we really would like to have this kind of parallel analogy between sort of dynamic interpretation of the objects uh, under investigation and static ones. And this is really, from a very general point of view, one of the aspects of the kind of research that I would like to tell you today. Now, more specifically, I will speak mostly, uh, almost entirely. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So please record it. Yeah. So, uh, and that's that's also good because apparently I'm able to read the, the chat. Okay, I was not entirely sure about that. Okay, great. Uh, so again, use it if you need. Uh, so I will speak uh, almost entirely about war problems. Uh, so the modern research in war problem, uh, it is uh, it has quite a long history. I will survey that, of, of course, very briefly survey it. And uh, it, it dates back to the very beginning of 20th century. So now it has more than uh, what it is more than one century old. Uh, as we will see, it's it basically developed to a whole industry of result with also some very uh, marvelous application, I regard them as so, some marvelous application of computability theory to general mathematics. But at some point, uh, this kind of research, well, I, I don't know whether I'm entirely supposed to say that, but whatever, this kind of research nowadays is a kind of uh, old fashioned. And so I, I really would like to make some sort of propaganda to uh, the work on world problems. And this kind of propaganda is almost entirely motivated on some basic core idea, the fact that one can revive this kind of research, one can revitalize this kind of research by basically using, uh, trying to use classification tools coming from the theory of equivalence relation and apply them to the world of war problems. Okay. So, and, and finally, everything I'm almost everything I'm going to say today, it is uh, a joint work with Andrea Sorbi that I guess all of you know, and his PhD student, uh, Valentino De La Rosa. Okay. So, let me start with the menu, what I can offer today. Uh, I will start with an introduction to war problems. Uh, I will what they are and I mean the most important result in the field and then eventually I will tell you that uh, even though nowadays we know a lot about war problems there is really a very basic aspect that somehow uh, is a sort of an obstacle to a complete uh, knowledge about them right so which I can already anticipate them it is the f that it is the fact that we regarded war problems as sets instead of regarding them as equivalent solutions. So the next idea it is to use uh, uh, a classification tool that, as Alberto already anticipated, it is a sort of an effectivization of Borel reducibility that computable theories has been used a lot, uh, myself included. So I will give you now a brief survey in the second part about the theory of C equivalent solution that are known by the acronym SIRS. And I will basically discuss on what is the general structure of SEERS and how this structure can be used in order to classify work problems. Then we'll focus on, on a nice question by Gao and Gerdes uh, from their paper on 2001 that somehow uh, reinitiated research on computable reducibility. I will say more about this. And so they basically ask a nice question about the expressiveness of semigroups relative to the war problems. And uh, we, we were able to solve this question, so I will tell you something about our solution. And, and then basically, uh, at the very end, I will say you just a few words about how studying the war problems uh, somehow is connected to some, uh, uh, I think, fairly interesting uh, interplay between algebra and arithmetic. So we will see that by war problems, you can ask in a very natural way uh, how much algebra structure you need in order to encode, in some precise sense of encoding, in order to encode uh, probability inside, for instance, Peano arithmetic, or in fact, I mean, any extension of Robinson arithmetic. Okay, so that's pretty much the menu for today. Okay. 
So uh, let me actually start by with a basic observation, right? When uh, suppose you would like to present an algebraic structure, okay? So this is something that is really uh, common in computability theory and in algebra. And in fact, we will see that it has basically it has two different interpretations in these two fields, or or they look, I mean, superficially different. So if you ask to a computable theorist, uh, what does it mean to present an algebraic structure? Well, they'll probably tell you that a presentation of a given algebra A is just an isomorphic copy of this algebra with a computable domain. So the idea over there is that you choose a computable domain and almost always the natural numbers because you don't want to have any hidden complexity in the, in the domain so that the complexity of the structure would depend entirely on the complexity on the, of the operations if it is just an algebraic structure. Okay, so so this is kind of nowadays of the mainstream approach in computable structure theory, computable model theory in the tradition of Ash Knight uh, or the book that Antonio Montalban is preparing. So the idea, for instance, it is that uh, a structure it is computably presentable if there exists an isomorphic copy with domain the natural numbers such that all the operations are computable. And again, let me stress that the structures we are dealing uh, with are all algebras in this talk, right? So there are no relations. Okay, so, so the complexity of a structure comes from the complexity of its operations, or equivalently speaking, we are on the complexity of the atomic diagram with this computable domain. Now, on the other hand, there is another approach, in a sense, to the presentation of structures, which is uh, completely mainstream in algebra. So, and to some extent is motivated by the fact that in algebra, one naturally deals with some structures in which the algebra structure itself is easy to describe. What is hard knowing it is whether two terms represent the same element. So more formally, what uh, you can actually define in some nice effective way, the pre-algebra, and then what is hard, uh, uh, but basically the algebra that you're really referred to, it is a quotient of this pre-algebra relative to some equivalent solution. So, so what you have in this second approach, it is that a certain algebra A is presented by a collection of generators, obviously, and, so, and a collection of defining relations. They just express equations over these generators, okay? And then what you have it is that A will be just the quotient of the term algebra, so basically, the algebra in which any single words, it will be just a finite strings of uh, generators. So the generators act freely. And uh, modulo the uh, equations expressed in, the, uh, in this collection R of defining relations. OK, so all of this, it's, it's obvious. I mean, it's, uh, it is in any basic course in algebra. Uh, so you have, in particular, that if x and r are both finite, then a is finitely presented. And if x and r are computable, then uh, uh, a, well, the structure a is recursively presented. And I would like to maintain, at least for this course, this kind of distinctive terminology, right? So computably presented, I really mean the first approach right so you are really defining directly the structure okay and so for being computably presented you really would like the operation and the relation in general to act on the elements that you are speaking uh, of uh, when i say recursively presented i really mean you define it some effective way the pre-algebra and then you algebra the algebra you're speaking of will be just a quotient okay now, just, just for terminology, I mean, some time uh, uh, for addressing this kind of like uh, uh, this analogy that you have between the different approaches. Sometimes in computability, you find the second approach speaking about CE presentations, right? Because in a sense, as we will see, uh, deciding whether two terms in a pre-algebra of recursively presented algebra denote the same algebra element, it is always CE, okay? But for the moment, in this talk, I will just speak about recursively presented, as people always do in algebra. Okay. So in particular, for instance, uh, if you would like to present the cyc cyclic group of order n, you can do that in a finite way, obviously, by just having just one relation which says that a to the n will be equal to the identity in the group. Okay. 
Now, what is interesting it is that there is a sense in which these two approaches are equally expressive, right? So at least relative to countable structures, right? I'm, I'm a recursion theorist, only countable structure exists, right? So, and this is motivated by the first isomorphism theorem. So, so the idea it is that basically any single count algebra, you can always think as a quotient of the term algebra, okay? Because there exists a surjective homomorphism from the term algebra into A, so that A will be isomorphic to the quotient algebra that is the term algebra modulo the kernel of this homomorphism. So in particular, a consequence of this, it is that if the algebra is a decidable type, uh, what you have, uh, it is, for instance, in the case of groups, what you have it is that any countable group will be isomorphic to uh, a quotient group of the free, free group. So basically, thinking in terms of quotients uh, and quotient generated by equivalent solution, at least uh, relative to countable structures, allow you to express whatever you need to express. Okay, so every countable algebra arises as a quotient of the term algebra on countably many generators. So what do you mean, uh, Chao, Chao Luca? What do you mean by term algebra? In the sense that you are anyway imposing some equations, like for example, when you say that everything can be seen as a quotient of a free group, you are already assuming that it's not the term algebra in the signature, but actually you are already imposing associativity and all the other axioms. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So, so to, to some extent, I'm mean, deliberately confounding all of this, but but you're right, right? So, uh, basically, it's actually at the delegate point, but anyway, it depends on what you want to do, of course. So, go on. No, no, so sure, what? sure. I, I mean, relative, uh, I, I will probably say more about that. Relative to the computability theoretic question, to some extent, uh, it does not really matter as soon as you what you're using it is an algebra of decidable type as soon as the axiom that you're considering for instance the group axiom or semi-group axiom you will be able to check in some effective way whether the single term the word that you actually realize uh, will satisfy this axiom or not I, I will expand this point further okay so uh, as I told you, what an important point here it is that the first approach uh, it is kind of the mainstream in computability theory. Uh, there are some exceptions. Uh, Selivanov worked on what he called positive structures, which are which basically says, well, an algebra it is positively presented if you have that there exists a pre-algebra in which the uh, algebra structures, so the operation of them are effective, and then uh, the algebra you're referring to, it is isomorphic to the quotient of this pre-algebra relative to some C equivalent solution, so something quite close to what we would like to speak today. And Kusainov also has quite a long-standing program about trying to study this second approach with computable theoretic lens. So somehow our work, it is in analogy of this kind of work. Now, but in fact, I mean, our goal, it is precisely observing that some important algorithmic questions emerge already when you adopt this second approach, and we'd like to tackle this kind of questions. In particular, we will focus on war problems. Okay, so let me move to war problems. Uh, the this. This whole world of war problems initiated by uh, a, a, a very important paper by Dan in 1911, uh, in which he lists three problems for group theory, uh, algorithm problem for finitely presented groups that he considered like the three fundamental uh, problems of uh, finitely presented groups. So one was the isomorphism problem, the other was, was the conjugacy problem, and finally, the one that we're going to really focus today, the war problem, okay? So the war problem for a finitely presented group is the problem of deciding if two words in the generators of the group refer to the same group element, okay? Now, and of course, I mean, relative to groups, uh, this is exactly the same of asking whether two words, U and V, in the generators, you actually have that U times the inverse of V is equivalent to the identity, okay? So now you have your words, the words are expressed in terms of the generators. You would like to know whether relative to this finite represented group, they actually denote, they refer to the same element. Okay, 
Now, of course, even though then define that for groups, uh, you can actually define that for any possible recursively presented algebra, right? And in general, we, we will define the equality in the algebra by this notation over here, okay? Now, notice that in some cases, of course, the word problem is trivial, right? So for instance, if the group is finitely presented and free, well, I mean, certainly you can check whether any two words would refer to the same group element. You just cancel the subwords that annihilate each other, and then basically you see whether these words coincide or not. Okay. Now, less trivially, there are many cases of algebras. I would say that at the very end of this talk, there are many cases of classes of algebra in which one can show that the word problem it is decidable. Uh, one example it is uh, proven by a very complicated proof by Magnus. Uh, uh, groups that are defined with only one defining relations, or you can have a billion semigroups, uh, etc. Right? But what about the general case? That that was exactly the question. So, is there a method? Is there a decision procedure that once for all you give it as an input, uh, like uh, for any possible finite presented group, you give it as an input two words, and you would like to know whether they refer to the same group element or not? Right? Do you have a decision procedure that rules them all? Now, what is interesting, uh, also historically, if you want, it is that uh, briefly the, then remark that the problems seem extremely hard and probably out of reach. Right? Now, and even for groups with very few generators and very few defining relations. Now, of course, I mean, this observation by Dan was the fact that he was uh, entirely aware that uh, uh, basically, you have two options. Either this kind of general procedure exists, in which case, I mean, some extremely clever group theorist might have found this. Or on the other hand, if it doesn't exist, how can you prove the known existence of a method or of a decision procedure? Of course, the conceptual missing piece over there was a clear understanding of this. And the landscape, the landscape changed entirely with the foundation of computability theory, which provided once for all a definition of what we really mean by a decision procedure, allow for negative proof or non-existence proof of some of decision procedure of this kind. Now, what is interesting it is that uh, uh, very early, by the end of the 30s, uh, uh, Kleene already observed, uh, after the proof of the understandability of the Altin problem, already observed that it was theoretically possible that also problems arising from general mathematics or not obviously connected with computation uh, could have been proven, uh, could be proven as uh, undecidable. Uh, so he made this small, observa small, small observation in a review in the JSL. And, and he also individuated as a candidate the word problem for finitely presented semigroup. Then in 1947, independently, Post and Markov proved the understandability of the word problem for semigroups, for finitely presented semigroups. So here we have just, of course, a set with uh, only an associative operation. So you ask only associativity. And as we will see, I will, I will give you basically the proof for this to give you a flavor of how reason in this kind of context. Uh, for semigroup, I mean, semigroup are so abstract and so general that encoding machine by them, it is fairly straightforward. Much more difficult it is the problem for groups, and it was eventually solved again independently by Novikon and Boone uh, by basically 10 years later. Okay, so, so now we know that there exists a finite represented group with unsolvable word problem. But let me first speak about semigroups. So, So basically, the problem that we have here it is that uh, uh, we'd like to build a semigroup with uh, unsolvable word problems. To do that, the idea it is to try to see how to uh, build a semigroup in such a way that we emulate an arbitrary Turing machine. So that's an obvious strategy because if you are able to do that, that then it's enough to take a Turing machine for which the ultimate problem is unsolvable, for instance, a universal Turing machine, and then you use your encoding into the word problem of a semigroup to obtain a semigroup with undecidable word problem. Okay, so how to do that? Uh, take uh, a Turing machine M that has as an alphabet the symbols. This will be the symbol occurring in its tape. And as internal states, uh, we'll have 
course, finitely many of those. Uh, and one specific uh, state of them, it is the terminal one, right? So whenever the Turing machine enter in the state QH, it just stops, it halts. Now, uh, of course, I mean, uh, it is just convenient to specify the terminal state. And I mean, of course, as you all know, instead of having an alphabet with M plus one symbols, you, can, you could just use two different symbols. Uh, but of course, I mean, Turing machines are quite robust relative to the, these minor changes in syntax. So it does not really make any deep difference. Now, the idea it is to emulate the Turing machine by semigroup as follow. So the generators will be, will just correspond to all the states that you have for the machine and all the letter in the alphabets together with an additional element H and H will correspond, will will basically encode left and, and right hand marker to the input that the Turing machine will consider. So basically the presence of H, it is something that will avoid problems of uh, basically, basically you would like to distinguish comput two computations uh, the, in which the input in you know, one computation is just a prefix of the other computation. So you basically have this, and then the encoding, it is straightforward, as I promised to you. So suppose that instructions are coded by quintuples, right? So, so basically, this means that in any single instruction, the head will constantly move of the Turing machine. Of course, if you only would like to change a symbol without moving, it is enough to going right and then going back left, OK? So now, suppose that you have an instruction of this form, Q A A K A L R Q J, right? Which obviously means that if you read in the internal states Q A, if you read A K, you replace it with A L, you go right, right? And you and in the state Q J. Now the idea is for any structure of this kind, you would like to add a relation in the semigroup. So you'd like to express an equation in the semigroup, which equate this word. The word QA, AKAT, and the word uh, ALA, uh, QJAT, right? And of course, I mean, and this for any possible AT. So for any possible generator, uh, any possible of these generators corresponding to the alphabet. So intuitively speaking, basically what you are doing it is you are uh, encoding all for any possible AT you're considering, you're encoding this behavior of going left. Right. So basically, you're, what you're considering it is what you're encoding it as a configuration step, right? And then, of course, I mean a final one, right? Relative. Remember that the role of this H will be to encoding left end marker and right end marker to the input that uh, it is currently read by the to the input of the Turing machine. So the idea it is that finally you also would like to have a way of encoding. Uh, uh, going to the very left on your input, right? So suppose that as an input you have a string of n many ones, you would like that if the Turing machine act going left, again, it would read just a zero or a zero in this case, right? So one of the cell in which you don't have the input information at the, at the beginning. So all of this, it is a quite straightforward way to do the encoding. And of course, to do something similar in the case of which you are encoding the instruction that will tell you to go left. And finally, that's a crucial point. You would like uh, also that uh, you would like this QH, so this word, to basically absorbing any other uh, generator. Right. So basically, you say that any word that start with QH or it ends with QH will be equivalent in the semigroup to QH itself. OK. Now, then it's not hard to see that uh, uh, this lemma, that of course is the crucial one, you have that the, your Turing machine M will halts on input Y. If and only if you have that the, the word H Y H, so again, this H will be essentially left hand and right hand marker for the input you're considering will be equivalent to QH, right? And then of course the idea it is that the alting problem for this machine will be reducible to the word problem of this semigroup. So it's enough to take a universal Turing machine or 
any Turing machine with an undecidable work, uh, undecidable Alkin problem in order to ensure that the work problem of, of the corresponding semigroup cannot be decided. Okay. So, so one crucial observation here: uh, this semigroup cannot be embedded in a group. Okay, and this this is for two reasons. I mean, first of all, it, it is it obviously depends on the fact that otherwise uh, it's it's impossible to understand why there is a gap of ten years uh, between the solution for for the semigroups and the solution for the groups. More relevant. Of course, here you are imposing in the semigroup the fact that this old, so that this QH will absorb the rest of the world, which, uh, which of course, in the context of groups, uh, will actually mean that, uh, any, that any single word U will be equivalent to the identity, so it will trivialize the group. So basically, to obtain a group, a finitely percentage group with unsolvable world problem is much harder. And in fact, I mean, Novikon and Boon construction, it is much more complicated. And it relies on the so-called H and N extension. And I will not go further about this, even though the topic is an extremely interesting one, but it would require me much more time. OK. Now, later that, I mean, uh, people, both algebraist and computability theorists, collaborate to refine all these results. And eventually what they, they obtain it is that the world problem of a finitely presented group can be of any possible Turing complexity or even M uh, complexity, many one complexity. So the idea it is that, uh, uh, of course, I mean, you can realize immediately that the world problem for a finitely presented algebra is always C, right? Uh, they were able to prove that uh, you can actually have them of any possible C Turing degree or even M degree. So apparently this might seem uh, a way of closing the circle, if you think of, right? Because, uh, because the point is that after all these results, what you actually show, apparently, it is that uh, uh, groups can realize any possible work problems relative to uh, finitely percent groups can realize any possible complexity over problems. And in particular, you're not really able to distinguish semigroups relative to groups in terms of the work problems that they can realize. OK, so but is it really true? Well, the answer is no. Right. And, and basically, the main point here it is that if you consider work problems as only sets, as we are doing here, a set of pairs, you basically obliterate a lot of their informational content. So why is so? Well, uh, take this immediate observation. If you take consider a group, right, a recursively presented group, then what you have it is that the problem uh, and consider two different problems. So for a word U and for a word V, uh, the the first problem it is the problem of deciding equivalence to U, and the second problem is the problem of deciding equivalence to V. Now, these problems are computably isomorphic, and in fact, both of them are computably isomorphic to the problem of asking uh, equivalence to the identity. So in a group, the equivalence classes uh, of the equality in the group are all uniformly computably isomorphic with each other. And to see that, uh, well, it's enough to take this map, right? So this will be the map that for any single word x will we'll map it to x times the inverse of u times v, right? And it's uh, it's really immediate to check that what you have it is that uh, uh, x, uh, uh, that the image through this map of x will fall in the class of, uh, of v, if and only if, in a class of u, if and only if you have that x, uh, it is uh, uh, equivalent to u, right? So basically, this is uh, a many one reducibility from the class of u to the class of v. In fact, this function, this mapping is obviously injective from worse to worse. And so it is a one one reducibility. And so you can conclude by my Healy isomorphism theorem that these classes are computably isomorphic, right? So, in other words, as I told you, in a group, the tasks of deciding equality to a given word have all the same complexity. Now, this is obviously not the case for semigroups. It's fairly easy to build the semigroups that uh, uh, do not satisfy this property. So in particular, for instance, uh, take the post-Markov encoding that I show you to you and take a word that do not correspond to any possible computation. So for instance, take uh, two consecutive uh, internal states. 
Q1, Q1, right? Now, from this word, uh, you cannot basically start any computation. And so since our equivalence was basically constructed to mimic exactly this computation, we actually have that these words are just singletons relative to the word problem. So basically, the moral of all of this it is that if you really would like to appreciate all computational aspects of word problems, you really should regard them as equivalence relations. So here's our core idea. It's, it's Luca, 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 I do not understand. On which set? On the set of terms? On the set of terms, yeah. So you, always, you have the set of dreary terms with respect to the signature or terms like free groups terms? Well, I mean, in the case of free groups, uh, from the point of view of computability theory, it does not really make a difference. Generally speaking, it does. I agree with you, right? But the point is that, I mean, you can both consider, if you want, terms in which you have, let's say, both U, V, and the inverse of V. Or if you want, you can already collapse these two and say that the only thing that you have is U. Okay, but so if I think that I have the term algebra only the signature, mm -hmm. and then I, I partition this and I want to understand the differences. So exactly. exactly. And right. in the case of group, this is uh, uniform because of this, which I understand why, because of this proof. Okay. Okay, okay. okay. yeah, perfect, perfect. No, but thank, uh, thanks for the question. I mean, yeah, I, I really, so, so the point is really this one. You have the term algebra in the signature, and basically, you would like to know that's the word problem for the algebra, whether these two words will represent the same element. OK. So, so here's the core idea. And, and again, it's a basic one. But I really would like to make some propaganda to this. And I really would like to convince you that I think it's a fruitful point of view. So the idea is to systematically revisit uh, all the world of the complexity of world problems. I give you just a glimpse to that. There is a, a huge literature. To be fair, more on the, uh, on, in the Russian literature, but I mean, also on the Western side. Uh, but the idea is that almost always, I mean, when we speak about the complexity of our problems, uh, this measure of complexity will be provided by reducibility on sets. So Turing reducibility, many one reducibility, sometimes one one reducibility. But again, uh, if you do like that, you obliterate a lot of information, right? So the idea is let's take seriously the idea that word problems are equivalent solution and use uh, to compare their relative complexity use uh, equi use reducibility that work on equivalent solution. So let's use the theory of equivalent solution, which grew immensely in the last decades. OK? So and in particular, since the word problems for recursively presented algebra are always CE, uh, we'll spe specifically rely on the theory of CE equivalent solution. So this is where I'm going to move now. OK. Now, now let's say, well, this idea of comparing the complexity of equivalent solution, this is where this reference to the scripted set theory kicks in uh, explicitly, and it, it will stay there uh, implicitly. Uh, so, so the idea is that, of course, it has been a major topic, and still a major topic of investigation in different areas of logic, this idea of comparing the complexity of equivalent solution. Uh, it allows in the scripted set theory this uh, uh, very robust analysis of the complexity of classification problems. So let's say that very, very generally, a reduction of an equivalence relation defined on a given domain X to another equivalence relation defined on Y is a nice function from X to Y such that that basically uh, induce an injective map on the equivalence classes. Right, so two terms are are adjacent if and only if their images will be as adjacent. Now, so so you really would like this F to push us down to an injective map on the equivalence classes. Now, of course, this is not a definition because nice is not a mathematical term, but obviously you would like to put some constraint. Otherwise, uh, if you have the axiom of choice, uh, you will always have that. Uh, as far as the uh, cardinality of R classes do not uh, uh, are not more than the cardinality of S classes, you will always have a reduction. And then basically, you can hardly say that this will encode this idea that the information of R is reducible to the information of S. So you will have two main interpretations in the literature. 
So in the scripted set theory, you have Borel reducibility. You typically assume that X and Y are Polish spaces. So, excuse me, Luca, ju just uh, R and S are E and F sometimes. Uh, oh, this slide. right, right. Yeah, 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 definitely. Okay. These are just synonymous, right? R is a synonymous for E and uh, yeah, S for yeah. F. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. So you know why? Because in the first writing, I, I write over oh, everywhere R and S. Uh, but then I, I didn't want to make confusion with the set of defining relations. And yeah, but thanks for that. Okay, so R should be E and this should be F, obviously. Okay, now in the scripted set theory, we have Borel reducibility. We typically assume that X and Y are Polish spaces uh, and F is Borel. But of course, I mean, people also study continuous reducibility and many more things that uh, a lot of you know better than you do. So in computability theory, the main interpretation it is computable reducibility. One just assume that X and Y are omega, the set of natural numbers, and F is computable. Again, there are exceptions. So people studied feasible reducibility. For instance, you might ask F to be polynomial time. Uh, I, I studied with some people uh, punctual reducibility. So you ask, uh, you consider F to be primitive recursive, et cetera. Okay. So, so that's the picture. And uh, now we really have E and F. Okay. Now, the most studied degree structure generated by computable reducibility is that of Sears, right? So these are deposit of C degrees of C equivalent solution, or as they are called in the Russian literature, positive equivalent solution. So Sears are fairly natural object to study. So first of all, uh, one example, a notable example of a Sears, it is provable equivalence in any consistent formal system. So for instance, fixed piano arithmetic. And then uh, you would say that two positive integers are in relation. If you have that piano arithmetic can prove that uh, the, the, the code, that their code of equivalent formula according to some good numbering of arithmetic formulas. So this is obviously C, right? And it's also, of course, a partition of uh, non-negative integers, okay? And another, which will be important for us, it is the restriction of PA. In fact, I mean, these are infinitely many series. So the restriction of PA to the sigma n sentences for any single n. Uh, the isomorphism of uh, finitely percentile groups, right? to just make an example. And of course, word problems, right? We are interested in Sears because word problems are Sears, right? Okay, now, by now we know a lot of things about Sears and uh, we, were, we were able to prove that uh, uh, the Sears uh, the fa as a poset, it, has, it is a complicated structure. I mean, in fact, it is the, uh, the most possibly complicated you can obtain. So uh, as I anticipated, I mean, back in the 70s, people starting studying Sears uh, in the Siena School, uh, Magari, Sorbi, Montagna, Bernardi, but also around Europe, uh, Visser studied them, and also Lachlan, and of course, Sershov uh, and people in Russia. So the, there was a lot of results about Sears, especially about universal Sears, Sears that have so much information that any other Sear is reducible to them. Uh, but then, I mean, this kind of research was put at rest for, let's say, one decade or so. And then there was kind of revitalization of the program, starting from this paper, nice paper by Gao and Gerdes in 2001. So they basically recast a lot of known results. In particular, they show that CIR, it is a bounded posset, and the top element, uh, it is the one of the universal one. It's really kind of easy to define a universal equivalence solution uh, relative to computable reducibility. You just write the equivalence solution in column and you encode the information of all the possible series in different columns. Um, and basically start with this initial segment of order type omega in which you have the identity, the quality mod n, right? So ID1 will be just the equivalence relation in which all uh, natural numbers are collapsed. ID2, one in which it will be split into classes, even an odds, et cetera, et cetera. So, and all these elements of I are called the finite series, and of course are the trivial ones, 
right? And everything else, like the infinite series, are much more complicated. So in this paper, we proved that the in, an interval of the one degrees, so uh, basically the uh, the sets relative to the one reducibility, so many one reducibility in which we ask the function to be injective. So this interval from zero one to the jump of zero one of the one degrees embeds into the series. And then there are nice consequences immediately from that. So first of all, you have that this posit is neither an upper nor lower semilattice. Of course, the emphasis is on the fact that it's not an upper semilattice against, for instance, Turing degrees. And, and its first order theory is undecidable. So recently, Andrews, Schreber, and Sorby, they proved that in fact, this first order theory is computably isomorphic to the first order arithmetic. And even more recently, still preprint, uh, Andrews, uh, Bellin, and I, we, we proved that the theory of all countable equivalence relation relative to computable reducibility is computably isomorphic to second order arithmetic, right? So generally what you have, it is really complicated structure the, that are produced by computable reducibility on equivalence relations. Um, and now a crucial observation, it is that the identity on Omega, it is not the least among the series with infinitely many equivalence classes. So, uh, and to see that it's, it's really quite easy. I mean, uh, just take an equivalence relation, right? In which you have only one equivalence classes being infinite, and this will correspond to a simple set, right? So a C set, such that in its complement, there are no infinite C set, uh, and all the other classes will be singleton, right? So, and basically it's, it's straightforward to show that the identity cannot be reducible to this equivalent solution, because otherwise you will, you will be able to compute a C set, right, in the, in the complement of this uh, uh, simple set, which is something that cannot exist. So the fact that the identity is not the least among the infinite series motivated this distinction that it is in this paper by Andrews and Sorby, a very long paper in which they prove multiple things, and they have this uh, uh, Star Wars terminology in which they distinguish between light series. Um, and so the light series are the series that are above the identity. So these are the series for which you can have a computable transversal, so a set which picks infinitely many pairwise non-equivalent numbers, and the dark series. So these are the series incomparable with ID. So I used to say many times in talks uh, this kind of Star Wars terminology, uh, but one time uh, Uri told me that uh, it was supposed to be like a beer distinction between light and dark, and I say, okay. So they also prove many things. I will very briefly say a few of them to you just to give you a flavor of this theory of series. So there are infinitely many dark degrees which are minimal over I, but there is no maximal dark degree. Every series has a strong minimal cover and they are of particular importance for the theory, those that have exactly one strong minimal cover. These are called the self-full series. So in particular, in order to falsify the being a lattice, it's enough to take any pair of dark degrees. They have no soup and no inf. Uh, notice that this is a special property of Sears in a paper in which we studied the delta two equivalence relation relative to computable reducibility. We proved that this result do not hold anymore. And also there are continuum many automorphism fix the dark sear, continuum many automorphism fixing the light sears, etc. Right? So many results. This is like a rough picture that you can keep in the mind, right? Okay. Now let's finally move to our results, right? So and of course now the idea it is to use computable reducibility to classify world problems of recursively presented algebra and try to obtain new and possibly, I mean, finer classification than the one that one would typically obtain by just uh, being limited to Turing complexity or uh, many one complexity. So in fact, sometimes we will actually ask for something more demanding. So we say that two series are isomorphic if there is a reduction from the first to the second, which it's all 
the equivalence classes of the second. Now, notice that the existence of such a reduction being S and SIR, and since a reduction is computable, already ensure that you have a backward reduction which eats all the classes. So intuitively speaking, if you think about that, uh, this is quite obvious. So the idea is if you have a reduction from R to S, uh, uh, which eats all the classes, uh, you would like to build this backward reduction for any single element. First, you wait for an image of an element which fall in the class of this element. This must exist because this uh, reduction must eat all the classes. And then you know where to uh, map, back map this element. Okay, now obviously what you have it is that isomorphism imply uh, by reducibility, but notably the converse does not hold. I would say more about that. So, and here, I mean, just for terminology, this idea of calling them isomorphism, it is in a category theoretic uh, sense. So if you take the category theory, the category uh, that is made of the equivalence relation in which the morphism are uh, mapping of equivalence classes that are induced by computable functions, you will have that this definition. It is exactly the definition of isomorphism. And this kind of category theory interpretation of equivalence relation and in fact of numberings was already introduced by Asher. So let me tell you briefly that few known facts about the complexity of our problems can now be rephrased in the terminology of Sears. So first, uh, it dates back to the to 71 even, this result by Miller, in which he proved that there exists a finitely presented group with a world problem, which is a universal sphere. So this is kind of having much more complexity than the one that you actually have in the original Novicum Boon. In fact, one can show that if you take the original Novicum Boon complex construction, what you have it is you have a lot of complexity in some special equivalence classes, but there will be also many other equivalence classes, many other leftover, which are fairly easy to manage. So basically, this construction it is a way of ensuring that the complexity it is well distributed in all the possible equivalence classes, the complexity of the world problem. Excuse and also, me, excuse me, Luca. Yeah. I don't understand this. Uh, didn't you show that uh, if for a group, uh, all equivalence classes are sort of uh, equivalent to each other? Yeah, sure. So, but this, how, how does this uh, is compatible with what you just say is about that particular group, which has one complicated equivalent, some complicated equivalence relation, and some simple ones? No, no, sure. I'm, I'm misunderstanding what uh, the meaning of this is. No, 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 sure, sure. Okay, okay. You, you agree with that. I agree with that, with that. So basically, I mean, the complexity of the equivalence classes will be always the same in a Turing way and even in some uniform way, right? But here, what you're asking for universality as an equivalence relation is much more, right? So basically, so for instance, uh, I have a nice answer for that, but I really, I don't know whether I would like to dive in too much on this. So let, let me just- Leave it as it is. No, 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 let, let me briefly say what's the point, for instance. So basically you can have a series in which all the classes are uniformly computably isomorphic and the series itself, it's fairly easy. So for instance, think of series in which all the classes are finite. So the identity satisfy this property, right? And of course, the identity is pretty low in the in the positive series, right? So on the other hand, there one can even build example in which all the classes have, let's say, the complexity of the Altin problem, and still uh, this class is far from being universal. Okay, so being universal is basically asking more than just having complexity in the uh, in the various equivalence classes you're considering. So, okay. for instance, basically we proved that in order to be a, uh, so the, this is in our paper we proved that in order to be universal, it must be the case that uh, all the equivalence classes are uh, effectively inseparable in some uniform way. And this is more, of course, of having a, only of requiring that the classes are of the complexity of, let's say, the Alting set. Okay. So, uh, and also, okay, this recent result, 
uh, that in fact there exists there exists a finite representative group with a world problem which is a dark seer, right? So in which you cannot have a computable transversal of words that are pairwise non-equivalent. Okay. So what about something new? Uh, we have this definition. So let's say that a class of algebras realize the series, all the series, if you have that every series it is in the same reducibility degree of a word problem of a recursively presented algebra from C. And it finitely realizes the series if it is the same. Basically, any single series can be realized as a word problem of a finitely presented algebra from this family. Okay, so first of all, now uh, it should be clear that groups uh, cannot realize all the series. Uh, this is just because the equivalence classes in a group are always uniformly computably isomorphic, and this is not true for all series. To have an obvious counterexample, take this series over here, where k is the Alting set. So this is a series in which you have only one class of very high complexity, and all the other are just singletons. Okay, but what about natural uh, other natural classes of algebra? And now we arrive to this question left open in Gao and Gerdes. So they ask if any series is equivalent up to computable reducibility to the world problem of some finitely presented semigroup. Or in other words, do semigroups finitely realize the series? Okay, that was the motivating question for our work. And, and I think that's an interesting question. Because if true, it would say that the theory of series it is basically nothing else uh, up to coding uh, than the theory of war problems for finitely presented semigroups. And moreover, it in a sense, it would nicely extend uh, uh, a wonderful theorem by Shepherdson that uh, is extending post and Markov solution. In this way, it says to you that if you have a uniform sequence of C sets, uh, then you can encode them in the equivalence classes of the word problem of a semigroup plus something else. So it says that there exists a finitely represented semigroup S such that every set A, uh, every set in this uniform list of C set will be Turing equivalent to one of the classes, right? So the idea that is that, yep, some, some question, no? Maybe not, okay. So, so basically this result by Shepardson says that uh, if you have- what is, uh, what is uniform sequence? Well, so basically you would like each of this set to be CE, right? But you would like in a computable way, once for all for any single C set, which element will enter in it. Okay. Okay. So, so basically, it, you can think that in a, let's say, in a binary function, right? It will take, uh, mm -hmm. take the input, right? The C set, you're considering and an element and will list this. So, and a stage and it will list that. So, um, so basically, so Shepherdson theorem, it is really telling you that you can encode in the equivalence classes of a semigroup any list of C set, but you cannot control entirely the semigroup. So there will be something else in the semigroup. So the question is basically, can you actually strengthen more this Shepherdson theorem and being able to control all the equivalence classes of a finitely presented semigroup? So we're gonna solve this question and unfortunately negatively, right? So the cool thing was having a positive solution, but hopefully by the hand, I will give you also some nice motivation for what, what you can do next with a negative solution. Luca, uh, I see that uh, you have still quite a few slides to show us, right? So maybe yeah. it's, it's a good time to, to make a break since we've yeah. been uh, yeah, no, 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 for about no, no. one hour, if it's yeah, okay no, no, with you. Yeah, yeah, no, sure. So let's do so this. So we can, we can make a five minutes break maybe and mm -hmm. start at yeah, yeah, five no, past. Let me the, let me just very briefly apologize because uh, I, I don't know, I was convinced that I even did a try but somehow, I mean, I'm taking more time. And okay, so so let's have a break. This is something that we we allow and encourage actually. So that's okay. Just maybe we can take a little breather and uh, and meet okay. in five minutes. Okay.
Okay? Yeah, sure. All right? Let's do it. See you in okay. a little while. It seems okay. that it's a good point to, to maybe take a break. Yeah, yeah definitely. I definitely. No. So, so think of the question in this, in this break. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. We start in five minutes and we restart in five minutes. Okay. Thanks. Luca, ti va di parlare? Vai, vai, vai. Vai, vai, Quindi, come in italiano vi permetto di dirlo. Quindi vai. il word problem è solo che una classe di equivalenza è complicata, significa? Mm. In quello classico sì, fondamentalmente. Quello classico sì, sto a dire. Sì, sì. Quello classico sì. Quindi nel caso in realtà appunto dei gruppi è fondamentalmente chiedersi essere equivalenti all'identità. Tutti, certo. E, e una, una linea che divide, cioè se le, la relazione di equivalenza ha questa proprietà, allora c'è una classe complicata. Vabbè, tipo tu hai detto universale, quasi tutte le classi sono complicate, mi pare che hai detto, no? Sì, 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 sì. Quindi ci stanno questo tipo di risultati che ti, che ti trasformano in formazione sui pezzetti. Sì, cioè, sì, tra sì, tutto, sì. Insomma, se è il modo giusto di dirlo. Però. No, no, esatto, esatto, esatto. In realtà è esattamente questa cosa. Tieni conto che in realtà allora, è, è un po' più delicato di così perché se hai una relazione di equivalenza che è universale, in questo senso qui, e hai un modo in realtà triviale di aggiungerci classi stupide, se vuoi. Eh? Ok, la maggior sì, cioè questo capita, sì, ok. Esatto, tu la, la codifichi tutta nei pari e i dispari li lasci stupidi fondamentalmente. Quindi, quindi l'idea è che in un certo senso appunto l'universalità da sola non è che ti costringa troppo su tutte le classi però su, insomma un sottoinsieme rilevante di questi su un'immagine computabile di questi sì ok un'altra cosa che non ho capito è non avevi detto che era Gao che aveva provato che ci stava quell'universale uh, in... no, 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 in realtà No, diciamo... Lo sai qual è la contra... La, apparente, ci mancherebbe contraddizione che ho trovato, che tu dicevi che quello... Eh, Gao aveva provato... Eh, poi, scusa, aveva fatto, fatto quello, quella sull'universale. Gao è universale, c'era cioè una. Uh, questa qua probabilmente sono chiamate universale. Splendid Poset. No, va un po' dietro, vabbè. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. Allora forse no, boh, non lo so. Per... No, vabbè, allora mi sono mi so sbagliato io perché avevo capito che l'avevano provato dopo, però avevi detto che invece c'era quel risultato del 71. Ah, no, no, esatto, esatto. No, ma in realtà no. Allora, dopo dirò qualcosa in più. Cioè, negli anni 70 hanno lavorato tantissimo a quelle universali, fondamentalmente, quindi a caratterizzare tutte queste scirre universali. Ah, allora già c'era una nozione di universalità e ci avevano lavorato, però dopo, quando Gavo l'ha ripreso, l'hanno fatto. Ah, ok, ok. Sì, okay. sì, esatto. Cioè, diciamo, quella era una definizione, ma infatti sono d'accordo, non mi piace troppo come è scritto, però l'idea diceva, vabbè, il, il top element di questo poset si chiama universale. Sì. Però eh, Gao riprende una terminologia che già esisteva da, dagli anni 70, insomma. Tieni conto però, che... Però è la stessa, però, cioè, è, la, è la stessa, sì, solo eh, che la vedo in due modi diversi, ho capito? Quello come il poset e invece l'altro... Vabbè, però è la stessa, sì. Ma qua c'è una domanda, eh, mi sa. Ok, ok, ok. Esatto, esatto. Qua Luca dice che è esatto. Questa qui è esattamente la controparte della, uh, dell'isomorfismo Borello, ok, class-wise. Mm. Sì, penso, infatti sì. Ok. <ride> Va bene. Oh, ok, eh, splendido, sì, queste sono esatte. Non, non so se devo ripassare all'inglese. O... No, no, era solo per fare qualche commento di collegamento, <ride> diciamo. Eh, so, tutte le, molte cose che hai detto sono, mimano in un certo senso cose che nel contesto classico sono studiate o sono state studiate, quindi molto elegante, diciamo, come, come idea, no? Perché in effetti... No, guarda, questo, questo mi fa tantissimo piacere, nel senso in realtà, ovviamente, era una delle mie aspettative maggiori. Cioè l'idea che andava a fare appunto il talk Torino-Udine, ho detto, ecco, questa è una grande opportunità per vedere qual è, quali sono le corrispondenze con uh, collaborare la riducibilità e, e le varianti. Ok, we, we, should, we should switch to English, I think, for... Uh, for... So that everybody can understand, I think. Okay. Yeah, think so, can, so. so let me okay. tell you that uh, in the chat now you find uh, some nice comment by the other Luca, right? The main Luca, okay? <laughs> And uh, uh, some nice comment that basically showing that uh, some of this terminology that we have in computability theory, it is nothing more than some sort of effective analogous of things that are well known in the scripted set theory. So I don't know if Luca would want to add something on this. 
No, no, that, that's all. I was just, uh, you know, uh, highlighting the correspondence because it's elegant it's to see that. I completely agree with Luca, although he knows more than me, and it's no surprise there is also the, the name of Gao. Gao is also a prominent yes. uh, reserve. In the... <laughs> of course, <laughs> Luca knows this better than me, but yeah, it's really it's not by chance that there is this, of course, mm -hmm. uh, correspondence. So, but it's very elegant. I agree. Definitely. I mean, maybe maybe now now that I that I destroyed my initial hope to do that in one hour, I. I would say, okay, let, let's take opportunity for spending more time together. So uh, I historically speaking, it's kind of interesting. I was saying that before to Gianluca. So the idea it is in the 70s, people studied that uh, with like completely different uh, uh, approaches. So the idea was mostly studying the numberings, uh, like in the Airshop way of doing that, or uh, um, I will say more about that, but probable equivalence in formal systems. So that was like the main uh, motivation for studying Sears. And so then uh, basically, I mean, when, uh, when Gao reconsidered this question, uh, what is nice is that basically he and Gerdes, they realized that there was this effectivization of uh, uh, Borel reducibility that was already out there, that was introduced for completely different ideas and was like worth exploring. So, for instance, this, this kind of notion of computable reducibility emerged very time, many times. There is a very nice paper by Koski, Emkins, and Miller in which they say, Russell Miller in this case, they say, okay, let's try to do like uh, an effectivization of the classical question that one have in Borel reducibility, uh, but now working on, let's say, C sets instead of like an, an equivalent solution being either directly defined on the sets or on the indices of C sets. And then they basically discovered that people were using this reducibility back again in the 70s, et cetera. So, so this is a notion that appeared many times and now it is, I guess, stabilizing with this notation, et cetera. But, okay. So, so, I think okay. you can you can start or you can continue. I mean, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Fine. So, um, so let let's remember now. Okay, uh, so the question by Gao and Gerdes, right? So the question is simply whether it is actually true that any sear is equivalent up to computable reducibility to the world problem of some finitely presented semigroup. So we know that finitely presented semigroup can realize can have were problems of any possible Turing complexity and any possible many one complexity, can you push that way further and obtaining that you can actually realize any possible equivalent solution, right? Now, uh, we're going to show that this is false, but let us first show that uh, the problem has a very easy answer if you consider all recursively presented semigroup. So a semigroup is called the right zero band if uh, it basically you have that a word it collapses to the very last letter, right? You have the last letter which absorbs the whole word. Now, uh, what you can show, uh, you would see it's uh, very easy. It is that the variety of right zero band realizes the sears. So what you have it is in fact more. You have that any sear is isomorphic under our notion of isomorphism to the world problem of a right zero band. So how to show that? Again, the encoding is extremely straightforward. So for any given sear E, you build a semigroup by starting with a computable, an infinite computable list of generators. And then basically you define relations uh, by encoding all the information of the sear. So basically, if you have that I and J are together in the sear, you collapse the two uh, generators together, and also uh, you and and basically you uh, you fix like the second requirement in order to satisfy the idea that you would like them to be right zero band. So you collapse everything to the last generator. Okay. So obviously, then the map from I to Xi computably reduces I to the world problem of the semigroup, and the reduction in fact eats all the equivalence classes. 
This is ensured by the fact that it's a right zero band. So any equivalence class we have will have as a representative one of the generator, right? And some of these equivalence classes will collapse, right? So it will it's all the classes, which mean that you have also backward reduction. And in fact, it means that these two SIR, E and the SIR corresponding to the world problem of this semigroup of this right zero band are isomorphic. Easy as that. Okay. So of course you can have the same result if you replace right zero band with left zero band, semigroup in which everything is collapsed to the first letter. And of course, uh, also it is not difficult to adapt the proof to show that monoids realize the sears. Of course, I mean recursively realize, right? So any sear, it is equivalent up to computable reducibility, but in fact up to isomorphism to the world problem of a recursively presented monoid. Now, before tackling the case of finitely presented semigroups and attack the question of Gaon Gerdes. Uh, let me tell you, let me discuss two classes of semigroups that do not realize the sears. So to give you a flavor of how to show that you don't realize the sear, and they will not realize the sear even uh, like relative to recursively presented member of the class of algebra. So remember that the semigroup is periodic uh, if it is torsion in a sense. So the idea is that for any possible element A, there must be two integers n and m such that a to the n is equal to a to the m. And an element is called, of course, idempotent if you have that a square is equal to a. Okay. Now, these classes of algebra do not realize the series. So the first one, it is non-periodic semigroups. So in order to have your class of algebra realize all series, you really would like to have uh, to contain in the class uh, uh, periodic algebra, uh, periodic semigroups, but in fact more. So the class of full semigroups with only finitely many impotents uh, do not realize the series. So in order to realize some kind of series, we will see which kind. Uh, you really would like to include algebra having uh, infinitely many impotents. So how to prove this? Well, again, the idea is pretty simple. So let S be a recursively presented semigroup with an element of infinite order, right? So this is a semigroup which is non-periodic. So then it's immediate to note that if you take the orbit of this element, uh, this will give you a computable transversal of the world problem. So it will give you a computable list of pairwise non-equivalent elements. Right? Otherwise, you have some periodicity, and this is exactly what we are, we are assuming you will not have for the element X. So this means that uh, the war problem of any recursively presented non-periodic semigroup, it is immediately for the non-periodicity, it will be always light. So in particular, you have that cannot realize any dark seer. Okay. Now let's see the other example. Uh, remember, we would like to show that uh, the class of recursively presented semigroups uh, uh, with only finitely many hidden potents uh, cannot realize all the series. So the idea is that if you have a semigroup uh, and this semigroup have only finitely many hidden potents, the idea is that you can fix them non-uniformly, and with the exception of these guys, then the map that will send any element to the square of this element will be a diagonal function from the world problem. Now, a diagonal function for a sear, it is a computable function that sends any given input to a different equivalence class. Now, the point it is that some sears cannot have a diagonal function, and this is the case of the restriction of the probable equivalence in piano arithmetic to the sigma in formulas. It can be proven that this zero cannot have a diagonal function, so it cannot be realized by any semigroup having only finitely many dependents. Okay, so these were negative results, right? And let's move to our uh, main positive one. One of our two main positive results. So there are series that cannot be realized by any finitely presented semigroup, and this solves negatively Gauss Gerdes question. In fact, we can show more. No class of finitely generated semigroups realizes the series. So as soon as you have, uh, as soon as you limit yourself to finitely generated semigroups, 
immediately you lose some shares in the things you are able to realize relative to the world problems. Now, the proof is a priority argument, right? It's a finite injury argument, uh, not too hard, but you have to take care of some aspects, uh, which diagonalize against all world problems of finitely presented semigroups. But interesting enough, we have recently individuated a natural property of Sears, which forbids realizability by semigroups. Luca, uh, Luca yeah. excuse me. Yeah. Can you go back? I don't understand what's the difference between the statement of a theorem and the, the sentence before it, basically. So why this is in fact, you are claiming that the statement of a theorem was stronger than the assertion yeah, before it? Yeah, sure. I mean, this is finitely generated semigroup. So for instance, you have... Oh, okay. But finitely presented means just a count, finitely many relations, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So okay. yeah, the relation can be infinitely many. Oh, sorry, that's my. But but of, but of course it has to be recursive because you are assuming blah blah blah. No. Yeah yeah yeah. Exactly. General, it could be anything. So yes. Yeah yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah no, sure sure. I mean good point. Uh, moving from finitely presented algebra to finitely generated, I mean the complexity from an algebra point of view typically explode because I mean the relation can be of any complexity. Also, also in the script is well I don't know there is this paper of uh, Thomas but there they consider finitely generated. If they were to consider finitely presented, it would be very different. So, of course, it can make a huge difference, as you are saying. While in this case, you can do it in any way. So, yes, yep. yes. So, so in this case, it's true that in a sense, the situation is made more tame for the fact that there is this constant implicit assumption that still the relation must be the the set must be computable, but but infinite. I mean, okay. So, and, and let's see this property, right? I mean, of course, not what is natural or not. I mean, it really depends on the context, right? But, but fairly natural. So we have a single property that uh, it is a combinatorial property that if it is satisfied by Sears, then immediately this Sears uh, uh, will not uh, be realized by a semigroup, a finitely generated semigroup, obviously. Now, and this is hyperdarkness. It is something we are currently working on. So a zero here is hyperdark if all its transversal are hyperimmune. So remember from classical computability theory, uh, the notion of hyperimmunity. So, so basically the idea it is that uh, this is a reinforcement of being immune, obviously. So immune for a set, it means that uh, it has no infinite C set. So hyperimmunity means that you are not able to compute a C set, not even in blocks. So let's try to make a little bit more formal this. Uh, the idea is that you don't have any C transversal for this equivalent solution, right? Not even uh, if you... So basically, you, you would like to exclude the possibility of producing a transversal also if you uh, allow a computable way of producing finite pieces in such a way that these finite pieces will be non-overlapping and you will have an element of your transversal, at least one, in the pieces, right, in each piece. So basically, the idea is you allow for a certain margin of error, right? So the idea it is that uh, having all transversal hyperimmune, it is that you are not able to compute the C transversal even if you allow for this margin of error, even if you allow for this computation in finite pieces. So the idea it is that for all transversal Y of E, there is no computable function such that, uh, yeah, exactly, morally a finite guessing of the transversal. So let's see the formal definition. So so the idea it is that D it is the, uh, the the standard the canonical index for a finite set, right? So D X it is a canonical way of coding a, a finite set, right? Uh, so the idea it is that you you don't want to have a computable list of finite sets such that there will be pairwise non-overlapping and each of them will contain an element of the transversal. So this is something you don't want to have, right? In order to be hyperimmune. So hyperimmune, it is not only you don't have in a C way the transversal, you really cannot finite guess the transversal in the sense that you are able to produce finite pieces that are pairwise non-overlapping, and each of these pieces will contain an element. 
Okay. So HyperDark series exist, and the idea it's immediate. I mean, it just follows from the fact that there exists hyper simple set. The set is hyper simple if it is C, and the complement is hyper immune. So they they exist. They are well studied in classical computability theory. So take the equivalence relation generated by this set. So this will be the equivalence relation having one infinite class equal to S, and all the complement of S will be just singleton. Now uh, you take this. Sorry, sorry, Luca, but what is DFN? Uh, yeah, so the the canonical index for so D, DN DN will be so the idea it is you would like for any possible finite set in canonical way you would like to produce an index to it. Okay, so for instance, if the finite set contain I don't know X and Y. A way to do that is just saying that the canonical index will be 2 to the x times 2 to the y. Okay. Just, just some... Times enough. 3 to the y, maybe. Hmm? Times 3 to the y. Yeah, 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 3 to the y. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I started being tired, but sure, sure. 3 to the y. Just some enough nice canonical effective way of associating to any single finite set a corresponding index. And you would like eventually, of course, to list all of them, and you would like that to be in a, some uh, bijective way. So, so the idea is okay. So hyper darkness is a nice property. So first of all, it is a property which is an invariant, uh, uh, degree invariant property for Sears, and moreover, it forms an ideal. So you have that the join of uh, of two Sear that can be nicely defined. The join of two series, uh, notice that the join will be something different relative to, will be in particular, will be not be the least upper bound. I remember I already told you that Sear uh, not, is not an upper semi lattice, right? That said, and then now you can rely, uh, react badly and say, okay, what do you mean by a join not being a least upper bound in the structure? Uh, the idea is that this join is just uh, like a uniform way of joining two relations, equivalence relation R and S. So you have R, you code R on the even, you code S on the odds. And then basically, I mean, it is well studied in the theory of series, what are these jo uniform joins, how they behave, Hyperdarkness is a property that is preserved by uniform joints, and uh, it's also uh, preserved uh, from below in computable reducibility. It's downward preserved relative to computable reducibility. So this hyperdark has some nice property, this ideal, and we can actually show that uh, all this ideal, it is avoided by the war problems uh, of the uh, of finitely presented semigroups. So no hyperdark seer can be realized as a war problem of a finitely presented semigroup up to computable reducibility. In fact, I mean, even for finitely generated, if you wish, you can replace here finitely presented with finitely generated. Now, also, it is quite interesting to notice that hyperdarkness allowed to dismiss a conjecture one might have about the complexity of world problems for groups. So the idea it is that a zero e is uh, realized. Uh, uh, now, by now, we, we should all, we should all know that a zero e, in order to be realized as the world problem of a group, you must have this property that all the equivalence classes must be pairwise computably isomorphic. Right. So the next question would be, is this a characterization? Is this condition sufficient? Is it maybe the case that whenever you have a sphere in which all the classes are computably isomorphic, then immediately for that, you can build uh, in some clever way a group uh, such that the word problem will be equivalent to this one? And the answer is no, predictably. So. Uh, and it basically follows immediately from the fact that there is an hyperdark sphere with all equivalence classes finite. So there is an hyperdark sphere in which all the classes are pairwise computably isomorphic. And since it is hyperdark, cannot be realized as the word problem of a group. Now, I'm cheating a little bit here because here I'm speaking about like uh, being just com pairwise computably isomorphic not uniformly computably isomorphic, so it's still open 
uh, I mean, of course, will not be the case, right? We, uh, we don't believe that. But at least theoretically, it's still open that if you have an equivalent solution with equivalence classes that are uniformly computably isomorphic, then uh, it might be realized by, by a finite representative group. Now, okay, just an incredibly small dessert in some like fascinating topic. I'm gonna say very little about that, and uh, basically this would open uh, just another uh, line of many things and just another full story, right? That one time I might tell you. So, few things about this kind of relation between algebra and arithmetic. So. I, over, I have already introduced this, uh, the relation of probable equivalence in Peano arithmetic and its restriction to the sigma n formulas. Now, uh, what is interesting is this result by Bernardi and Sorbi from the 70s. They proved that these two series are universal. So in particular, probable equivalence in Peano arithmetic has so much information in it that any single series is reducible to it, but they are not isomorphic under the definition of isomorphism that I give it to you. Okay. So, and, and basically to show that they are not isomorphic, it follows from the fact that this guy over here, for any possible choice of n, will have, sorry, n uh, greater or equal than one. So now this, uh, as I told you, this equivalent solution for any possible choice of n cannot have a diagonal function. On the other hand, you certainly have a diagonal function in here because this is already provided by the negation, right? If PA is consistent, it will certainly not prove that fix, if and only if, not fix, right? So if you give it X as an input and you take the negation of this formula, which is just a computable function, of course, so this negation will be mapped to something which is not equivalent to it. Okay. So, so in other words, this actually means that the counter schroeder bernstein property fails for the series by reducibility do not imply isomorphism. Or if you'd like to take that closer to computability theory, it means that the Mayhill isomorphism theorem do not hold in this context. And this discovery initiated a whole area of research on universal series with the idea of basically classifying the isomorphism types of them and um, there has been a lot of research in this. Uh, and here's a fasc fascinating problem that I like so much. So the idea is, okay, so how much algebraic structure you need in order to encode arithmetical probability into a word problem? So suppose you would like to encode all arithmetic, basically what arithmetic knows about itself, so all probability in a word problem, how much algebra is needed? There are partial answers. So the first answer, it is it dates back even to the 60s. Of course, absolutely not in this terminology, but and it's resolved by Purell and Kripke. They proved that there is a Boolean algebra with word problem computably isomorphic to piano arithmetic. Now, in a sense, it is not surprising. I mean, the coding it is uh, the, the obvious one in a sense. Uh, if you if you just define uh, like as the zero all the anti theorem as one all the theorems of PA and then all the undecidable sentences of PA will be somewhere in this pose set and you define like as the join of two elements the disjunction as the meet the conjunction the implication in the obvious way etc uh, basically you obtain a boolean algebra right okay so Recently, we proved that there is a non Boolean ring with word problem computably isomorphic to PA. And here, the proof uh, is kind of delicate. It, it requires uh, some work. In particular, it requires uh, infinitely many applications of the, uh, of the fixed point theorem, of the recursion theorem. This happened many times in Ethereum series. So, Ethereum series, let's say, uh, the there is this kind of like really strong use of the recursion theorem, typically in the most difficult theorem of the field, there are of the area, there are like this kind of applications and infinitely many applications. And so the, all these applications are laid down in a priority tree. So this is not as hard, but still, I mean, you really have to uh, take care. And, and here's it, there is this open question. 
that we we struggle a lot with that and currently we are not able to solve it. So can uh, uh, piano arithmetic, uh, arithmetical probable equivalence, uh, can it be realized as a world problem of a finitely presented group? Now, the idea is that the main difficulty to attack this problem, it is that the known example of algebras, which can emulate arithmetic, uh, requires at least to emulate, uh, at least, sorry, uh, two operations. Two different operations. So this is why we are using a ring. Um, now, in a sense, this is reasonable. I mean, basically, you really would like to emulate, in a sense, uh, uh, the 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 soup and the if, right? So, or or at least, I mean, in all the known strategies that we have. On the other side, of course, I mean, groups are incredibly expressive. You can uh, do with them a uh, uh, crazy amount of things. So there is some possibility that one is able to encode all of arithmetic probability inside the word problem of a finitely presented group. And also a positive solution would give a nice bridge between proof theory and group theory. Okay. Now let me conclude with some uh, uh, further directions. To be fair, I mean, and I really tried to give you uh, today talk to give sort of an advertisement for the overall project, right? It is literally a project, uh, not metaphorically. I just submitted a project in this kind of topics and some other. So um, wish me good luck, okay? <laughs> so uh, there are many, many possible directions to still to be explored. So um, one obvious it is trying to characterize which here are realized as the word problems of both semigroups and groups. For recursively presented semigroup, it is the only one for which we have a solution. So all the series, but what about the others, right? So for instance, I mean, it, it sounded disappointed at first to have a negative solution for Gao and Gerda's problem, but now it might be regarded as exciting because it still open the question of, okay, so who are these series can, can be realized by finite represented semigroups? We know that hyperdark will not part of the picture. Is it a characterization? Should we refine it better, et cetera? And also any possible comparison you can think of between different algebras, right? Now, a second step that we, we just started doing that, it is, well, as I told you, many algebras, uh, in fact, are, uh, many algebras have a solvable word problems. So that's the case for lattices, that's the case for commutative semigroups, uh, the case for groups uh, with only one relation, etc. So, so these are all cases for which uh, uh, computable reducibility is too coarse to examine, of course, to classify the complexity of solvable world problems. So if you really would like to classify them, you have to move to feasible reducibilities. And here you have multiple options. I mean, the most natural one, it is primitive recursive reducibility and polynomial time reducibility. And it would be interesting, and we just starting to do that with polynomial time reducibility, to try to understand what's the overall picture. So what is interesting it is that in the world of feasible reducibility, really strange things happen or things that we are not used to. So for instance, uh, if you take, uh, uh, if you take uh, a primitive recursive equivalent solution up to uh, primitive reducibility, you have a, the corresponding posit, the degree structure, it has a lot of structure. So remember that I told you that in the case of Sears, there is very little structure. So basically killing reductions, it is something that uh, it is quite easy to do, right? In the case of equivalent isolation. So you typically don't expect much structure, but in that case with primitive recursive reducibility, we can actually show that uh, you have a dense lattice. So a lot of structure, this is kind of surprising and it calls for further research possibly connected with algebra. And next, uh, other decision problems, right? So conjugacy problem, uh, isomorphism problem, uh, or divisibility problem even, right? I, I like this one. Uh, so basically knowing it for two words, right? If you have that, uh, the word U refers to an element, of course, let's say the divisible group of an element U that divide V, right? So, or, or where, where the divisibility makes sense. So I like this because of course, divisibility do not give rise to an equivalent solution, but to a pre-order. 
and uh, it has just emerging the, the theory of CE pre-orders, right? So it would be nice to somehow connect this theory, this new theory of CE pre-orders with some problem, with some decision problem in algebra, which naturally give rise to pre-orders rather than equivalent solutions. Okay. So that's it, everything that I have to say today, and that's the last word problem for you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Luca. And, well, I know I'm clapping hands, but <laughs> uh, I think and for everybody, um, are there any questions or comments? I concern conjugation is something is known. Uh, okay, so for the classical problem for conjugation, uh, uh, is it is known certainly that there is a finite represented one in which the conjugacy problem it can be uh, of any Turing degree. So for the classical one, uh, relative to equivalent solution, as far as I know, nothing. You should look into that because there, I mean, you can have different sizes. Like if it's the center, they are all. Uh... This element is in the center, then it's a singleton and stuff. It can be, it's not as uniform as the, mm. as the other relation you are considering for group 13. But yeah. this is just a trivial uh, remark, but uh, yeah, yeah, it, it, the same. It would, as, yeah, it would be great, in fact. I mean, basically, in the project at some point, I also put the fact that it would be nice to consider them uh, basically at the same time, both problem, right? So you have something like, uh, you have a finite percentage group, right? And uh, now you consider both the word problem and the conjugacy problem as here, right? So which pair of series can be realized as being the first one, the divisibility problem of finite percentage semigroup, sorry, conjugacy problem, and the second one as the word problem? Mm -hmm. I see. All right. All right. Other questions or comments? Uh, yes, I have a question. I'm Luca. Um, okay. So, building on the analogy between uh, isomorphism or computable bioreducibility for equivalent relation mm -hmm. with uh, Borel bioreducibility and class-wise Borel isomorphism, I have a mm -hmm. question. You uh, said that the two notions in the computability side do not do not coincide because there is this equivalence of piano arithmetic, arithmetic and the other one with the N which are mm -hmm. uh, Borel, no, uh, computable by reducible, but not isomorphic, right? This was the, exactly. uh, the theory. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Okay, my question is whether you have some condition uh, which ensures that for uh, equivalence relation uh, satisfying this, this condition, the two notions coincide. And the question comes from the fact that, from the fact that in the classical setting, if you have two Borel, uh, orbit equivalence relations. So two equivalence relations which are induced by an action of a group and mm -hmm. moreover they are Borel, then they are Borel by reducible if and only if they are Borel isomorphic, class wise Borel isomorphic. So you have a condition orbit plus Borelness, which implies that the two versions of the, the thing coincide. And of course they can be different uh, uh, as you as you pointed out in the computability case, there are counter examples also in the Borel uh, reducibility. So you have the negative results saying they are not the same. I'm asking, are there natural conditions which ensure that they are the same on a restricted class of equivalence relations? Okay, so re really nice question. Okay, explicitly stated, uh, I, uh, as far as I know, there are no uh, conditions like that. Uh, that said, now uh, it comes to the mind that maybe some of the known property uh, should might imply this. So, for instance, there is one property that is called uh, self-fullness. So, the, the idea for uh, self-fullness is basically that you have uh, an equivalent solution R, which is self-full, if any self-reduction to it uh, cannot uh, omit uh, equivalence classes. Okay, so you should hit all the equivalence classes in any self-reduction. Uh, now, the idea it is that I think that it should be not too hard to show that if you, first of all, if you have like two, uh, so this is a property that it is invariant in the degree. So if you have an equivalence relation which is self full and is bi-reducible with another one, this other one will be self full. Okay. 
And then I guess that if you have this kind of computable bioreducibility that will not hit all the classes, uh, from this, I think that you can go back and forth uh, with these two uh, by with these yes, two reductions, uh, and you basically I see. no, that, that's clearly the case. But th this is something uh, okay. Already speaking about reducibility, well, it's reducibility to itself, okay. But it's uh, I, I'm looking for something external in a sense, okay. like, <laughs> like yeah, yeah, if sure. fuel insulation is recursive in this specific sense. I mean, very simple in this specific sense. Then yeah, the no, I mean, yeah, you're right. Th that said, I mean, for instance, this self-full one can be first order defined. For instance, they are uh, they are exactly the element in the poset that ah, have okay. only one strong minimal cover. So basically, if you want, you can take like this first order definition relative to the poset and say this is the condition that uh, implies this. Yeah, it's still relative to the poset, so relative to the reducibility notion, I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I agree. I agree. No, but, uh, first order in what sense? Because I mean, Borel is uh, L omega one definable. So I mean, uh, in this sense, is 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 first order. It's somehow. No, no, but, yeah, but I didn't relative, understand in which sense first order. Yeah, yeah, relative to the positive, right? So, relative to the positive of reducibility. So it's. Uh... I see. I see. Well, Alberto, I thought it was. I see. I see. And also, I have another comment, which is maybe a suggestion for a uh, line of search, um, right. suggested by the counterpart. Okay, just know the counterpart in the Borel setting. Once you have the Borel isomorphism, class-wise Borel isomorphism, which is your uh, isomorphism, uh, you can define a, a stronger reducibility, okay, uh, which is the following. You say an equivalent relation E reduces in this strong sense to an equivalent relation F, if it, there is a Borel and invariant um, uh, subset of, uh, of the domain of F, mm -hmm. such that E is reducible to the restriction of F to this Borel and invariant set. Isomorphic, sorry, not reducible. Is isisomorphic to this set. Okay? So in a sense, it is, you can, how, uh, you can how cut... How large this set? What? Uh, I mean, this, this Borel invariant set, how, how large should it be? No, that doesn't matter. It's oh, a Borel okay. invariant set, which is isomorphic, well, where the F is isomorphic to your original E. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, E is totally contained in F in a very strong sense. Mm -hmm. So once you have your isomorphism, you replace just Borel by recursive. So you say E is uh, strongly reducible to F mm -hmm. if there is a recursive invariant subset of the natural numbers such that f restricted to that is isomorphic actually to your e. Mm -hmm. So this is a stronger pre-order possibly and mm -hmm. could be interesting and could be uh, yeah, could be more faithful in transferring properties for example because you know it's really being isomorphic to uh, something. Right. So, so there is only one little redirection in this. Uh, we, we explore that uh, uh, a little bit. Right. So, um, the, the idea it is that basically you can have a notion that we call strong isomorphism. So basically, I mean, uh, the same terminology uh, kind of kicks in. Uh, and the idea it is that uh, an equivalent solution E is reducible to uh, F in this strong way if basically the reduction it is induced by a computable permutation of omega. Mm -hmm. uh, which is, in a sense, I guess, e even more than what you are asking. Uh, and uh, I mean that, at least in the case of Sear, this one, uh, it is, uh, uh, it can be proven that it's in a sense it's too, too demanding, uh, because basically the point is that, for instance, under this reduction, you really would like to respect the cardinality of the equivalence classes. Yes, for example, yes. Something that in the typical approach, uh, we absolutely no, that, that, that's clearly fairly strong. I mean, uh, yeah. we have also other things like that, but they are really strong. So the, the one I was, was suggesting, okay, can be rephrased as follows. If, if you have just a classical computability reduction, mm -hmm. the saturation on the, of the range of the map is a computably enumerable set, okay? Mm -hmm. So the strengthening okay. is required that the, the saturation is actually recursive, not just a okay. computer. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's nice. That's nice. Okay. Yeah. And that's the, the, well, just a suggestion. I don't oh, have any no, result. Great. Yeah, I really <laughs> okay. Well, okay. Thank you. All right. Are there more questions? No comments? 
If not, I think we can uh, we can thank Luca for uh, for this very nice talk. Also for the questions. I think it has uh, interested the many of us also with different sort of uh, backgrounds. So it was very useful. I think. Uh, uh, so we, we thank him again. I don't know if you want to clap him or you know to give him a round of applause. <laughs> and uh, when we we are meeting again uh, with our seminar next week, next week it will be Asaf Shani. Uh, speaking on uh, here, I have it. Uh, anti classification results for countable Archimedean groups. So uh, there are again groups, in, in some sense, in, in the in the in the in the hair, let's say. And uh, thanks, uh, thanks again to Luca and to everybody for listening. Bye bye. Have a nice evening. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye.